Hank Yeln is happy. Hank Yeln is recording all this, so we better make sure that he's happy as well. Good morning. Um, first of all, because so many of you were here for the first time, you probably don't know me, um, which is good, because then I'm actually talking to people who haven't heard me talk for like 100 times before. Um, my name's Joost. I'm married to Marika, she's here as well. Uh, I'm the founder of a company called Yoast and a father of four. Um, I'm currently back at Yoast as interim CTO after having left only just like five months ago. Um, that was entirely the plan, but I'm there. Um, and together with Marika, uh, we, the, the two of us invest in quite a few companies uh, that you might have heard of in the uh, WordPress space as well. Um, Honestly, if you want to hear anything about this, see me later, because that's not what we're here for. I'm hoping this works. It doesn't really, so we're going to do it like this. Um, I want to talk about websites and the environment. And all of you might be thinking, what's the link between that? How does my website have a negative impact on the environment? Because honestly, it does. And most of you probably don't realize how much of a negative impact it actually has. Websites are hosted by large or small hosting companies. One of the largest hosting companies in the world was actually kind enough to buy Yoast uh, last year. But there are, these are huge corporations that have lots and lots and lots of servers. If you're Dutch, you might have uh, heard, followed along in the recent discussions about data centers that we have in several places in, in the Netherlands. All of these data centers use tons and tons of electricity. And the question is, why are they using all that electricity? Is, is your site using that much electricity as well? Well, it is. Electricity usage for your website is cost by people visiting your website and your website generating those pages. So you have a WordPress site, I assume, I think that's, that's why all of you are here. Um, and that WordPress site generates a page when someone visits it, and then that data has to be sent a, uh, across the internet to your computer and it needs to be rendered there, etc. All of that takes electricity. The question is, how much of this can you actually control? What can you do about making your site less impactful? I'm going to use an example. Um, this is actually my father-in-law, who has a very nice, very simple website. I built this for him. It's based on WordPress. It's very tiny. All the, web, all the pages it has, you can see in the menu right there. And this front page consists of four files. It's two images, the HTML of the page itself, the CSS for the page itself is actually in the, in the HTML, so it's all one file, and it has a favicon. So remember that, four files. This page doesn't get a whole lot of visitors. My father-in-law is retired. There's really no reason for him to have a, a whole lot of visitors to his website other than the great articles he wrote, which you really should check out. Um, but he had 160 page views in the last 30 days. I took this two days ago, so it might not be exactly true, but you get to, to gist. 160 page views. Let's consider and that we had four files per page view. That should be 640 hits to his web server in the last 40, 30 days. Now I'll let you take a guess how many hits that website really got in the last 30 days. Do you think it's more or less? More. more. How much more? Five times more? 50, 100? 
Let's see. In the last 30 days, this website had 608,000 hits. 608,000 hits. That is approximately 950 times more than was needed for the actual visitors to those pages. I can tell you from having looked at many, many, many websites that this is not uncommon. This happens everywhere. And why is this a problem? I'll show you the math later on in my presentation about how much CO2 this is, but this means that the impact of this website is hugely made bigger by things that are not visitors, not normal users. So what is happening here is bots. Search engine bots, search engine optimization tool bots, lots and lots of hackers crawling the web to find stuff, etc. Entire data centers are wasted on stuff like this. This should be a very, very small website with very negligible impact. And instead, it is serving tons and tons and tons of pages. It's important to note that this website did not change in the last 30 days. It didn't send any notification to any other system out there that it needed to be crawled. It didn't send any change message to Google. It has all the things it needs to tell people to actually properly say, hey, we, this page hasn't changed. It's run on Cloudflare. It fully supports what we call HTTP 304. If you're not technically inclined, you can fully forget that, but if you are, it means that we can send not modified headers. It does everything right, and still it gets a ton of hits. So this is me seeing that happen and going absolutely batshit crazy. Because think about it, this is a very small site. On larger sites, the impact of this happening is much bigger. And of course, search engines need to crawl the web. They need to build up their indexes. I, as the founder of Yoast, I have done my fair bit of SEO. I understand that search engines are actually very useful tools and that we use them to drive a lot of traffic to a lot of websites in the world. So that's not necessarily a problem. But we all use Google. And we might use Bing, and someone somewhere else might use Yandex or Baidu. But does this Dutch website need to be spidered by Baidu, by Yandex? Search engines targeted at other languages and people that will probably not read it in Dutch? I don't know. One of the biggest users of this website is Ahrefs. Ahrefs is a SEO tool turned search engine, and they spider a lot, so much. And I'm thinking, who's paying for all that? Because it's costing them money too. But all of these tools are spidering and spidering and spidering, and that just causes a lot of traffic. But even if we say, hey, there's 10 major search engines and maybe 20 major SEO tools and some other things, we get to 60 tools. How is it possible that we get to 950 times the amount of hits? Where does that problem get created? And it turns out that it's actually a compound problem. Those search engines and tools crawl too often, and we should talk to them about that. But the other problem is that hackers are consistently going around the web trying to figure out what is broken on your site so that they can hack into your site. 
And the reason that that is still something that they do is because it's meaningful. It's because they actually do find lots of sites that are broken that they can hack into. So if we get better at security, that becomes less meaningful and they'll do it less, you'd assume. But the one I want to focus on now is that sites have way more URLs than you think. Because you'd think for an average site, five pages, 30 blog posts. Maybe a homepage added, no, in total 35, 40 URLs for that website, right? In reality, in WordPress, this is much more likely. You've created 30 blog posts, you've added some tags to it, not realizing that every tag that you create creates a new archive page in WordPress and, and therefore creates a new URL to crawl for all those tools. You've created some category pages. You automatically, if you don't disable them with a tool and WordPress core doesn't allow you to, so you need a plugin to do that. You automatically have date pages. You automatically have author archives. So instead of 35 URLs to crawl, you have way more URLs to crawl already. And this is only the stuff that you could actually click to in your browser. Because hidden in each of these posts, WordPress adds way more stuff. We, WordPress generates a comment RSS feed for every post. So the comments to that post live in a single RSS feed that can be crawled. And you're like, but search engines aren't interested in that, right? Well, if you'll ever look at your own crawl logs, you'll see that they crawl your comment RSS feeds every day, if not multiple times per day. The most visited pages on Yoast.com, it crawls the comment RSS feeds for those pages every 30 minutes. Those things never change because no new comments come into all posts, but they still crawl them at 30 minutes. We also have two OEmbed URLs. OEmbed is a very nice protocol that you might remember from having a, a, a Vimeo or YouTube link. You drop it into your editor and it turns into a video or, uh, or whatever it is. You can do that with WordPress posts as well. There's two ways of doing that with JSON and with XML and WordPress conveniently adds both of those to the source of every blog post out there. And search engines crawl every one of those links every single day. Within those two OEmbed URLs is one embed URL. Actually on most WordPress sites, you can just add embed to the end of a permalink and you'll get the embed version of that page. Search engines find that in those OEmbed URLs and then crawl that too. We also create a short link for every page. It's just a redirect, but you have to boot all of WordPress to get to that redirect so WordPress is, is launched every time some, uh, some search engine or other bot decides to look at that short link and see where it goes. And then there's a REST API link. This is one of the newest additions to this whole feast where you can get the REST API version of that post. I don't know why WordPress exposes all of this on every page without ever asking you whether that's needed or not. I think we shouldn't, but every time I start having that, that discussion, a certain guy called Matt tells me that he wants to keep it. Um, then on top of all this, every hit to your website or every page view usually has a few more side effects than the website of my father-in-law because most of y'all probably have a lot more CSS files and JavaScript files and images than just four files for a page view. 
So normally, the impact of a page view is much, much higher. I've taken the liberty, and I want to make absolutely sure that the team, the WordCamp and team is not getting mad at me. So uh, I've taken the liberty of using their site as an example. I want to say that they can't change most of the stuff that I'm going to show you because they host it on WordCamp.org and if they were at liberty to change a lot of these things, they would. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not on them. This is on WordCamp.org itself. But if you view the source of those pages, you'll see these links. No normal user is ever going to see all, any of this. But it's there, and every bot on the planet will find it and crawl it and, and go deeper and deeper and deeper. This doesn't end. I started looking at bot logs when I was working for The Guardian, this is about a decade ago now, I was working on the migration from Guardian Co UK to TheGuardian.com. And we, we started generating logs for how often does Google actually visit our site? And where is it looking? And what do we, which pages do we need to do something with when we migrate from the one domain to the other? And I've been doing SEO for a while but I was still shocked. Because in large sites like that, what Google does is it determines a list of hub pages where all the new sites posted, so the tag pages and a couple of others. And it would crawl those pages, about 85 of them, every two seconds. Literally, 24 hours a day, every two seconds. Bing did the same. At that time, Bing sent about 2,000 visitors a month to The Guardian. I don't know how, if any of you ever look at your analytics and have looked at how much traffic you get from Bing, but getting traffic from Bing at all is pretty uncommon in the Netherlands. Um, but it would crawl at that rate. It would crawl ridiculously fast. And we were having the discussion like, we are literally using entire servers that we're paying for just to give Bing the contents of our website. Shouldn't we do something with it? Well, I think we do. So what can we do? Well, to have less crawling, we need to create less URLs or at least stop linking to them because the only reason that they're crawled is that we're linking to them. That REST API endpoint that we're linking to is very useful if you're using it. But funnily enough, most of us never need that link in that page to actually use that REST API. So why not just remove that link and, and just remove a whole lot of crawling. If people actually want the comments RSS feed to your pages, I don't know who here still uses RSS on a daily basis. And this is in a room full of gigs, I see about 10 hands. I mean, outside of this room, there's not a whole people anymore that know what RSS is. But of those people who uses RSS regularly, who of you uses comment RSS feeds? I mean, I was a very, very big user of RSS back when Google Reader was still around, but I never used to comment RSS feed. It's absolute nonsense that we expose that all the time. So, we're going to disable those extra URLs. Now, I had built a nice plugin for that, and then I decided maybe we should just roll this into Yoast SEO. Um, so we did. Um, and we're going to, uh, I'm going to show you how that works. I also want to talk a bit more to you about tags and how we clean up more of those URLs. So if you use Yoast SEO, and otherwise there are other means to do this, but it is actually fairly hard to do most of these changes, you can, disable a lot of these URLs. 
And I would suggest that you do, because you're actually reducing the amount of crawls that your website is taking. It also means that Google is spending the time that it's crawling your websites and crawling stuff that you are actually interested in. Because a lot of the time, when it is crawling your comment feeds and your RSS feeds, it's not crawling your new pages. And the new pages are the things that you want to show up in Google's index. I also want you to have less tags. I've been reviewing sites as an SEO for 16 years now. Every, well, one in three at least of every website has more tags than it has posts. If you realize that the sole purpose of tags is to connect posts to each other by topic, then having more tags than posts is meaningless. And the problem is that everybody uses tags as they use tags on Instagram, which is a completely different thing. Because on Instagram, you're connecting your posts to a much wider array of posts on that tag. Here, you're just solely doing it within your site. So please, clean up your tags. And while you're at it, clean up your categories too. Because WordPress gives you two taxonomies. I don't know why it does that. I don't think it's necessarily a good idea that we give people two taxonomies for a small website. The fact that you can add more is great, but why you need two, I don't know. But if you do, clean them up. And also, don't feel bad about yourself. Yoast.com uses tags exclusively. Why? Well, because we had categories too, and then we had an SEO tag and an SEO category. Yes, even us at Yoast make stupid mistakes like that. It happens. It's not a bad thing. But make sure you have only one. There's really no reason to have both. Clean that stuff up. It would actually do wonders for your SEO as well to clean that stuff up. And make sure you redirect them all properly to pages where they fit. If a, if a tag only has one post in it, delete it, redirect it to the post that, that was in it, problem solved. And don't create all those tags anew. Now WordPress has more bad habits, and attachment URLs are my favorite because I've never made mistakes with those. <laughs> um, Yoast SEO has a feature to disable attachment URLs, which you should use. And if you don't use Yoast SEO, then your SEO plugin has this feature too, because all of us have it. Um, why? Well, because attachment URLs are a stupid idea. When you upload an attachment to WordPress, a file or something else, WordPress generates a URL for it. The thing itself already has a URL, and the attachment page is fairly often not used. But it is very often linked to anyway, because WordPress does this automatically in some cases. Get rid of them, please. It's, it really is better for your site. And then we have date and author archives. If you run a website with only one author, your author archive and your homepage archive are the exact same thing. Only if you have a lot of authors and a lot of posts do all author archives start to make sense. My favorite example of an author archive is on a website called ma.tt from Matt himself. I mean, the author archive is, is useless, but it's there. He's the only author. And this is all stuff that WordPress does wrong, but unfortunately, there are other bad actors in this space as well. So 
On all three of these pages, WordPress would serve the exact same page. And the FBCL ID parameter that you see in the second URL there, you might recognize when you click on in Facebook to a page, it adds this. Why does it add this? Well, if you have a Facebook remarketing tag on that page, then Facebook can connect the remarketing tag to that, to that visitor and knows who was there, etc., and where they came from. First of all, I think it's not a very good idea to do remarketing in general. Um, that's an entirely different topic I'll happily talk to you about. But this, this FB click ID, and Google does the same thing from Google AdWords. And then Google crawls it itself. So it sees links with a Google click ID from Google AdWords and starts crawling those URLs to check whether they're the same as the URL that it's actually pointing to. We redirect most of these things away on Yoast.com, but it's actually fairly hard to do that reliably. So you have to look at your own website and see like, hey, which of these are coming in? The sad story is that that means that most of you would have to look at your logs, which is fairly technical, and then create redirects for parameters that you don't use. Not something that anybody is going to do, I think. Luckily, there are some ways to optimize that. Um, and we are talking a lot to search engines about how to improve this. First of all, I want you to, and I'll share these slides online later so you don't have to write this down, but if you have a Dutch website, then Baidu, Chinese search engines, you probably don't need. Yandex, we talked about that one. Russian search engine, you probably don't need it either. Sasnam is actually a Czech search engine. It has still survived. It is as old as Ilse, which some of you might remember in the Netherlands. <laughs> and I now see the youngsters from Yoast thinking, what was that? <laughs> um, because people don't know that anymore, but some of those search engines survived in those countries. And we need to help search engines. Because search engines need to figure out what to crawl and what not to crawl. Now we are talking to Bing about this a lot because Bing was the worst offender and has actually improved a lot over the last few years. I was emailing with Fabrice, who's the head of Bing before this presentation, a very nice French guy who leads up Bing and has actually made it into an OKR, a uh, performance indicator for his team, how efficient they crawl. You know why? Because it makes sense economically to them as well. Less crawling means a lot less money spent. So they're working on something called Index Now. I had very stark criticism of that when it first came out. They've changed the standards, luckily based on the feedback that we and others gave them. And it's now actually fairly good. And what they're trying to do more and more is move to a protocol where you are telling the search engine, I've just created this page, I want you to index that. Funnily enough, as an SEO, that means we've come full circle. We went from URL submission, where you had to send the URLs to, uh, on a form of the search engine to, to get them to be indexed, to them crawling all the web, the, the web by themselves, and we're going back to your URL submission again. Because it doesn't make sense for them to figure out which pages actually should be having visitors. Now, another thing that's very important for that, especially for the search engines that actually support it, everyone but Google, is last modified in XML sitemaps. We've been doing that in Yoast SEO for forever, but WordPress core is now once again working on getting last modified into the XML sitemaps for WordPress core, which is very important. 
Because then what a search engine can do is it can grab the XML sitemap from your site, see which pages changed, and then only crawl those. It's simple, you'd think, but Google keeps on saying that last modified is not stable enough and too often goes wrong for them to actually trust the signal. So they just rather keep on crawling everything. I hope that changes at some point. Now I'm going to make a slightly big jump, but maybe not as well. I'll show you later why. I've been mentioning before that the WordCamp NL website has a lot of CSS and JavaScript, et cetera, and that doesn't make it necessarily faster. And I want you all to build faster websites. Why not and why? Well, not just because the user likes it and because Google likes it, but because faster websites use less CO2. It won't save you crawls. In fact, for a lot of search engines, if your website starts responding faster and being faster, they will maybe even crawl your website a bit more because they just assign a number of crawls to your site. They have a, 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 a bucket of pebbles like, and they take one out every time that they crawl, uh, they crawl your site. So they might not necessarily crawl that much less, but the difference is staggering. Remember those 608,000 hits that my father-in-law's website had in the last 30 days? This is a purely hypothetical number. I'm afraid it would actually be higher for the WordCamp NL site. But if the WordCamp NL site had those 608,000 hits, over a year it would produce 3,000 kilograms of CO2. We can talk about our gas bills, and we can talk about everybody needing to drive electrically. If you're building websites, this is also a problem you need to fix. That's a lot of cups of tea, and I don't even drink tea. That's 141 trees for one website. And if you're thinking that's weird, well, look at how many data centers we have and where they place those data centers. We have a couple of very big ones in the Netherlands, in Groningen, next to the energy sources. My father-in-law's website is really fast. I had some fun making it really fast but it only produces 56 kilograms of CO2 with the same amount of hits in a yearly basis. That is a ridiculously big difference. That is why you need to make websites faster, even more so than because we're all too lazy to wait for another second. It's just better for the environment. It's 50 times less CO2 just by being faster, being a faster site. Now, what if we optimize crawling? I've shown you some things that you can do yourself and we are continuously talking to the search engines about that. But if we would optimize crawling for real and we would still give, them a, a, give all those bots a fairly big allowance of crawling our site. So instead of the 640 hits per month we'd get based on the page views, we'd allow double of that. I think that's generous. I think it's ridiculous that we'd need anything more. It would use 0.12 kilograms of CO2 on a yearly basis. We can actually change this together. We can make the whole web use a lot less energy. And we should. It's over 25,000 times less CO2 than what, what would happen if 
we kept on going like we did and we used designs like the WordCamp and Else site with all of everything it has, which is much more common, by the way, than what the site of my uh, father-in-law is. So, I'm coming to the end of my presentation and I'm going to ask you, what are you still doing here? I want you to talk about this, think about this. Start blocking bots that you don't need. Create less URLs. And complain to people crawling you excessively. Preferably on Twitter and other places where everybody can see it and they care. Because if I, on my own, can shame Bing into actually crawling better, then you can help me do that and we can do a whole lot more. I really think that we can make this more, well, better for the environment, better for ourselves. And the funny thing is that in the end, this should actually bring down the cost of hosting. Because right now, you are paying hosting for those 608,000 hits. Because that's what those hosts are serving. And if you have larger websites, and you look at these, uh, these stats, you'll find that a lot of your servers are running only for bots. So you can save your own bill as well. With that, thank you. And, and now, Wendy was still a bit surprised, sorry. <laughs> We do have time for questions. I think, yes, I think for a lot, actually. Questions. Are there any questions in the room? Not only from the audience, but also from the speakers. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 What hashtag can we use to use on Twitter? That's a good question. I should have thought about the marketing of this better. <laughs> what hashtags hashtag can we use on Twitter? That's a good, that's a good question. We should, fit, we should come up with on our, like right now, actually, probably. Um, but optimized crawling would probably be a good idea to, to start with. And, and just tag me and I'll, I'll float it along. And I'm at Jay DeVolk on Twitter. DeVolk, yeah. Okay. You can do a Yoast too, but then a whole lot of people start working on it, so just do me. <laughs> So the first thing, if you're already using Yoast SEO, go into the settings, uh, go into the settings and, and enable all those crawl optimization settings. We don't dare to enable them by default for everyone because if your site depends on some of these being there, it, we might break it. And we don't like to break sites. Um, so that's the first thing I do. Then secondly, depending on your audience, I would start blocking bots. There's really, if, you're, if your site's in Dutch, as I said, why would Cessna more? And they are crawling your site. You can be almost 100% certain of that. Um, and then start improving your website speed. In the end, the, the, the combination of those is what's me, what makes a really big difference. And uh, it's also, Start thinking about what you're putting on online there and whether it's, it's really needed. And I think that's also a discussion that we, we need to have more. I think a lot of the things that you, you need to do manually now, we should actually do in WordPress core. So is there anything we can do to help get that going? Um, well, keep talking about it. Keep asking about it. Uh, ask, ask the WordPress core team, which most of them will want to do this. There's a question over there. You aren't going to get mic, so please stand up. I don't think this one is on yet. Is it on? It, it is. It, it yeah. sounds on. OK. Good. Hi, uh, thank you for sharing your message. I think it's important to, to spread it around. Um, I sense uh, some minimalism in here. That's 
sometimes strange for me for hearing from a SEO or a marketing person, I don't know. Um, less is more, is something I'm, I'm hearing. Um, did you have a change of heart sometimes? I mean, this is me assuming. No, 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 when, not really. What, what did change? So, I honestly, funnily enough, the things that you're doing to optimize for the environment here are entirely good for your SEO. And most of the time your SEO benefits thinking about, hey, what needs to be online and, and what doesn't need to be online and which message do I want to sell very well. So uh, no, I, I didn't have a change of heart at all. I, in fact, I've been talking about this topic, I think for a decade now. Um, it's just that the time seems right for all of us to actually start doing a bit more about this. Um, it's, it's been a problem for quite a while. And it's also, the search engines have invested a whole lot into making better algorithms to search and in understanding what's on the page, etc. But they're basically crawling in the same way as they were 20 years ago. So it's time for, well, some more improvement in that area from their side. And it's also time that we, as, well, as the world, start thinking about what do we want to allow? Do we think it's okay that, well, you could go home now and start a crawler and just crawl the entire web? And do we think that that is a good idea, that everybody can just do that? Or should we have some rules around that? Should it be a bit more opt-in instead of opt-out? And there's a whole, Oh, there's a whole lot of discussions that should be had around this, and I'm not going to answer all those questions today because I can't. Um, but it, I think it is something that we, well, that, that society is ready to talk about now. And we have all these discussions about data centers, but nobody ever talks about this. And the reason that those data centers are there is mostly because of this. Google's data centers are, for the last, vast majority of things, doing this and sending out YouTube movies. That's what they do. I, well, I, I'd hope so at some point, but it, it, PR has never been my strong point. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would actually be a very good route to get some of those URLs and core removed. Yes. Yeah. Cool. So for my question, there's a technical question first. A couple of years ago, I reached in, created five pages, 20 blog posts, and all of a sudden, the backup was more than a gigabyte. And it turned out that this team, I'm not going to shame and admit, um, cut every image that you use into 18 different formats in case you make a mistake. Does it mean that WordPress creates a link to each and every of that image? Yeah. So I think um, that maybe we should also check our theme creators that we buy themes from to see if that's what they're doing. So what, it, to change these settings. Yeah, well, so what WordPress does, you can register it in image size, and if you register it, then every image you upload will be changed into that image size as well. There's no, there, there's on or off. There's no in between, like saying, hey, I only need these for these types of images, or I only, there are very good solutions for fixing this. So far, Matt is blocking all of them. Um, he has literally, just this week, cancelled WebP, which, was, which would have been a great improvement uh, uh, to come into 6.1, yeah. 
or by default for everyone. So, but there are good solutions for this, and so far they're being blocked because that would hamper some people in what they're doing. I don't agree. Um, that might be clear. Um, but yeah, no, you're right. If you go into your theme and you see a lot of image sizes, that's not a good idea because your server will... Lit well, every upload you do takes longer because what it does on your upload is it changes to... It, it literally makes a version of that image in all of the different sizes that you need. And you don't need them. And you know that, but your theme doesn't know because it's a stupid little thing. Then I have another question. The links stay behind. I don't know whether that's necessarily a problem. I mean, if it's a stock image that you no longer have in your website that, that someone can't reach anymore, that probably doesn't really make that much of a difference. I'm, my opinion is that we should change more of these things for users and not have users change them. Yeah. I agree with that. Because, because it's just too hard. So we should just make this better in core or whatever editor it is you want to use. <laughs> so there is one more question at the back. And Sabine up yeah. front. <laughs> so, um, I love facet size. However, I'm still wondering, like, um, isn't it just a drop in the bucket compared to like streaming video services or ad tech? Uh, no. I actually think that you'd be shocked to see how much traffic this is. Um, it's hard to calculate that right, but that's true for all of these things. But if you consider the 608,000 hits that we talk about for my father-in-law's website, that is one of the tiniest websites in the Netherlands. My, my wife is now mad at me, but... <laughs> no, but... It, it, and we have a ton of sites. If you consider that the Netherlands has more than two million registered domains, it's probably way more, I don't know if there's anyone here that actually has it, but there, there are tons and tons of sites. It's doing this everywhere. And on most sites, it crawls a whole lot more. Yoast.com gets this amount of crawls on a daily basis, almost. And that's a huge site, but it is like, at the same time, there are a lot of sites like Yoast.com. There's a lot of in-between. This is a huge amount of traffic. That being said, that doesn't mean that all those video servers should not optimize their video streams. Of course, they should also do that. But the thing is that we talk about data centers as something very far away from us. And it's actually, they are there because we do stuff. And we can't just complain about not wanting data centers and then just keep on doing whatever it is, what it is we're doing. My question is, in an ideal world, which role would hosting companies play in spreading this message? Well, I work for one. Um, I'm an advisor to Newfold, and I intend to spread this message far and wide. We host millions of WordPress sites, uh, and just sites in general. If hosting companies together can fix this, that would be ideal, but it means us talking to search engines. And Luckily, we're now getting to the point where I can talk to some of them, and they are getting, they are being open to the idea of, of improving this. But it's also very hard for them to build something that they can actually spread across the web. Google is involved with WordPress because in WordPress they can optimize these things, and then they can change it for 30% or so of what they're crawling on a daily basis. There's more sites that run on WordPress, but they don't update. So if you don't, and if they don't update, then Google doesn't get the benefit either. So yes, we should talk about this. 
hosts should come together and talk about this with those search engines more, and everybody should talk about this more, and also to their customers. Hosts should be helping their customers baking faster websites, because that helps as well. And maybe hosts should start help, help their customers build robots.txt files and just block stuff. And I'm myself, I'm getting very, very close to going from opt-in to opt uh, from uh, opt-out to opt-in, just blocking all bots in robots.txt by default and allowing the search engines that we want to crawl our site. But that is, to do that in EOS SEO would be political, to say the least. <laughs> so we're not there yet. Thank you so much for your talk. I'm coming up on stage with you. <laughs>